Jesus deemed fit to talk about. I want to go on into, into the message. Be reconciled to your brother. You have to do it. It's for you. It's like he's saying, get it sorted amongst yourself. To use an analogy from what he's talking there about going to the judge and going to the accuser and uh, all kind of legal goings on, uh, uh, deal with it out of court. Get a settlement out of court. Don't go all the way there. Get it sorted even before. In other words, sort it out among yourselves. Or to use another analogy, you're sitting down um, for an appointment to meet with someone. It could be at work. Or it could be with a friend who's asking for your help about something. But you're trying to talk and you're hearing this screaming outside through the door. And you're just sitting down to have a conversation and you have to say, listen, we can't really have this conversation until that stuff out there that's sorted. Would you please just go and talk about the kids or whatever? And then we'll have the conversation. Deal with the stuff. It's an impediment. We know that it's the elephant outside the room. Go, let's get it sorted, and then we'll carry on with our conversation. So, uh, the, the, the context here is you're coming to bring your gift to the altar. You're coming to a place of worship, but you know that there are other issues in your life that really need to be dealt with, relational issues. Is it, go and get them sorted. And you can do it. This is a message of empowerment. You can act. You don't even need a judge. Deal with it out of court. Don't even ask me to come and help you fix it. You can do it. You really can. So it's really as a message of empowerment. Now, I haven't forgotten, and I won't let you forget the theme that, the sub theme, if you like, that I introduced earlier uh, about the second dimension. Because we have to understand reconciliation in three dimensions. But uh, before we do that, we need to begin with what reconciliation itself actually is. One of the best definitions that I picked up, and I've looked around a number of definitions, and this is about the best I came across. Reconciliation is God's work through the death of Christ biblically, this is biblical then, reconciliation. Reconciliation is God's work through the death of Christ by which sinners are brought back into spiritual fellowship and harmony with God. Reconciliation essentially is the reparation of a broken relationship. It's the removal of hostility, the restoration of peace and friendship. The root problem, biblically, the root problem is sin. Now, that may be our sin, or maybe someone else has sinned, and I maybe just have to just pause for a moment on this one because there are two things that cause the breach. There's the original wrongdoing itself, but then there can be the offence that's caused by the wrongdoing, which can often ends up a bigger problem than the sin. So uh, I go and I do something terrible to you. And a root of injustice and bitterness and anger, perhaps unforgiveness, takes root in your heart. I want to tell you that's more dangerous than the actual sin. It's more damaging to others than the actual sin. Because it festers, it's like a poison. And, and, and it fills you. And it has effects, even though you're not trying to, on all the people you love around about you. And it's a terrible thing. That's why sin is such an awful thing. Because the offence that it causes is more damaging than the actual sin itself. But there is a remedy, isn't there? We understand, we know that the remedy is grace and forgiveness. Because when you forgive someone, you let yourself out of prison. They're not affected. It's you that gets let out of prison by your forgiveness of others. They're unaffected by whether or not you forgive them. 
But that, and that's the awful thing about sin, is when somebody hurts or harms someone, it's the victim that often ends up carrying the more damaging, ongoing sin. So I've done something wrong to someone, and I've repented, and I've received God's forgiveness, but that person hasn't forgiven me back, they haven't, they're bitter and they're angry, and someone comes to me and says, how can you be so happy because you did that? And I say, well, I, 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 I'm deeply sorry that I did that. I, I've repented and I've asked God's forgiveness. I know I don't deserve it, but I received it and I have it. And somebody might say to me, oh, well, that's convenient. But it's more than convenient. It's the truth that happened. And the person who says that convenient is the person who is living and languishing in the greater problem than sin in its sense, which is actually the offence. So I, I throw that in there because I don't I'm going to, I don't have really time to go into the theology of the whole the whole thing. But when I say the root problem is sin, it, it's sin together with the offence that's caused by it. They're like inseparable <coughs> twins almost. <laughs> Cousins, if you like, they go together. They can't be separated. So the root problem of, of the broken relationship, of the hostility, of the enmity, is the sin and or the offence that went with it. And either one, both of these, we are required to go and deal with. So whether you are the offended or the offender, you equally have got to go and get an out of court settlement. <laughs> You yourself, don't expect the judge to fix it, you fix it, that's what he's saying. Go and, and uh, be reconciled to your brother, Jesus. Don't bring it to me, sort it out, then we'll talk. <laughs> is that, that's the, that's the, the understanding. You see? So, uh, the root problem is this sin and its offence which breaches relationships, creating a dividing wall. Okay? A dividing wall of separation and hostility. Uh, and reconciliation requires then that the sin be dealt with and its consequences too. The offence that goes with it. Uh, the wonderful, the good news is that Jesus Christ, through his death on the cross, paid the price for all our sins. Our sins against God, against each other, against the universe. And on the basis of Jesus Christ's sacrifice, God freely offers forgiveness to all sinners and let it be known, all have sinned. And that includes the offended party. We are all sinners. And one of the greatest inhibitors, or the greatest blocks to somebody forgiving another person is they fail to see that I am actually capable of being bad too. I don't have a higher caliber of human flesh than that person has. I too am dependent on this grace that I am now being asked to show to that person. So, on the basis of Christ's sacrifice, God freely offers forgiveness to all sinners and all have sinned who will repent and believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior. God has made reconciliation, this is, this is my proposition if you like to you today, God has made re reconciliation possible through Christ, but it is we who make it actual. Let me say that again. God made reconciliation possible, but we make it actual. Be reconciled to your brother. He doesn't command you to do something that you are not empowered and able to do reasonably. Be reconciled. So, reconciliation is provided by him, but it's made actual by us. Just as God, the one sinned against, took the initiative towards our reconciliation, so Jesus is telling the one who's coming to the place of worship to offer his sacrifice to start the process. It seemingly is the one who is coming closest to him who's to begin the process of reconciliation. That may be the one who was sinned against or who did the sin, but the one thing we know about that person is that is the one who is actually now thinking about worship. 
that's the person who is to begin, or the only person who is placed to begin the process of reconciliation and to take the first step towards his brother. And you know I'm talking about men and women, I'm just using generic terminology here. Just as God the one sinned against took the initiative towards us in Jesus Christ, so we take the initiative. Grace is most freely dispensed by those who understand their own need of it and are best placed to initiate that process themselves. And so that takes me then, he says, when are you going to get to your message, Alice? That takes me to the dimensions of reconciliation. And this is an awesome, a, a thrilling thing. Can I start with a third dimension? I really ought not to do this. But I, should, I, I want to start at the end because I want to bring it home in the beginning and middle. The third dimension of reconciliation, this healing, this reparation of the divide is to the cosmos. The third dimension of reconciliation is cosmos. Okay, let the Bible say it. Could you turn with me to, uh, we've got the scripture for Colossians chapter 1. Turn with me if you have your scripture to your Bible handy to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to read these verses. What do we mean by cosmic, or a, 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 a reconciliation of the cosmos? Um, Galatians chapter, uh, sorry, Colossians chapter 1, and verses 18 to 20. Listen to these verses. It says that he... Jesus is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and that in everything he might be preeminent. Okay, that's Jesus. That he might be. What's this got to do with reconciliation? Read on. Next verse. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven making peace by the blood of the cross all things are to be reconciled to him do you know that when Adam sinned and Eve sinned the effects touched the entire planet it touched agriculture Touch business, touch all the spheres of public life, everything. Don't, don't think anything was untouched by the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin. The effects were cosmic, and Jesus Christ came to fix the whole lot. Amen. But it starts with us, but I'm, I'm beginning my message with the, the third dimension. Because it's ultimately the cosmos. Come on, what's your what's the famous verse? John 3, 16, you know it, don't you? For God so loved the cosmos. World, yeah, translated world. But the Greek is cosmos. For God so loved the cosmos, the entire created order, that he sent his only begotten son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He came to change the whole planet, the whole beyond the planet, the spiritual as well as the physical. This world and all of creation, where everything spun out of orbit, orbit the moment Adam and Eve sinned. By effect or directly, everything was affected. And Jesus Christ came. God so loved his cosmos, he said, I want that thing working again. And we've read Revelation 22, haven't we? The cosmos gets fixed in the end. What do we fix? Reconciled to God, brought back into harmonious working order and relations. That's what cosmos, cosmos doesn't mean big, it means working order. Remember what the opposite of cosmos is? Chaos. That's the opposite in Greek, the opposite word for cosmos is chaos. In other words, it's a it's a harmonious functioning working order as it was created in the beginning to be. Everything's working, it's sorted, it's fixed. It's flowing, it's, it's not like two steps forward and one back, it's not like we're putting thing into, putting water into buckets with holes in it and everything. No, it's back into functioning 
in working order, it's sorted, it's fixed, everything is fixed. That is the third and ultimate dimension of reconciliation, and everything now is in flow with him, and the midges are gone. I believe in that. I mean, uh, do you really think, and you have to hear, do you really think there's going to be healthily functioning midges? I don't Anyway, but the point is, I'm, I'm joking, but the point is, it's cosmic. Now, let me then take you back to the first image. And I've touched on it there already. I say when Adam and Eve sin, the first dimension of reconciliation, the ultimate reconciliation, is when all of creation is brought into harmonious function in relationship with its creator. But uh, the first dimension is vertical. The third is cosmic, the first is vertical. In other words, it's between us and God. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 20 and I think that you've probably got that on the slides up there too. Second Corinthians chapter 5 um, in fact um, yeah um, maybe from verse 19 Second Corinthians to just go on verse 5 just to get the context there. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verses 19 to 20. This is vertical reconciliation the reconciliation that has to happen between us and God before any of the rest of it's even going to begin. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making this appeal through us, and we appeal, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So we've been given this whole message of reconciliation to the world, but it starts with us being reconciled to God, the command there. It's a different one from the command of Jesus that we began with, and that I am getting to in my conclusion today, to be reconciled to your brother. Here though, before that, we've got be reconciled to God, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20. How can someone who cannot reconcile his own relationship with God possibly begin to be a minister of this reconciliation to the world? It must begin between God and me. It must begin in my relationship with Adam's sin. The fellowship between him and God was broken, between Adam and Eve with God, was, and God was broken. They sinned against God and there were consequences. The relationship between Adam and God was broken, between Eve and God was broken. The consequence of that was the relationship between each other started to fail. Blame came in, didn't it? That woman you gave me. Almost the immediate consequence of the vertical and I've taken you seamlessly into the second dimension, which we're going to come on to in a moment, which is the horizontal. There's the vertical, the horizontal, and the cosmic. But the relational, the interrelational dysfunction began as an outflow of Adam sinning against God. How many of you read in your Bible the story of David and Bathsheba? I'm not going to open that story for anybody who hasn't read it today, but, but have a read of that story. It's a terrible story for King David is responsible for the death of his neighbour, a good man, Uriah. And then he gets into a, a, and he gets into an adulterous, having got into an adulterous relationship with Uriah's wife Bathsheba. And a prophet comes 
to David and confronts him on this terrible thing that he has done that led him to that he virtually murdered him. He got somebody else to do it for him, Uriah. He committed adultery with Bathsheba. He did all these things. In other words, he, 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 he sinned against his brother, his fellow man. But what did Nathan the prophet say? Or what did Nathan the prophet came and, I beg your pardon, and convicted him and he said, you are the man. And he told him of the sin that he had done. What did David say? What was David's response? Well, if you want to, I'm not going to look at it now, but if you want to in your own time, look at Psalm 51. When God, when David is personally convicted of his sin and what he's done, what are his words? He says, against you only have I sinned. Well, I thought it was Bathsheba and Gerat. No, 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 no. That was, a, it was, that was the proof that the vertical had gone. In essence, the greatest thing that he was doing when he sinned against Bathsheba and Uriah was actually to use his word against you only have I sinned. In other words, I can't kid myself all oh, that just things went wrong with people around about me. No, 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 no. Things were already going wrong between you and God. I can't justify myself that I might have been right. No, it was me and God that was a problem. As revealed by the way I treated my fellow man. The primary, the first dimension uh, of alienation, of hostility, of broken relationships between him and God. Take you into the New Testament. Ananias and Sapphira. <coughs> and read that story. It's hot today, isn't it? Ananias and Sapphira, they were struck dead. And they took their bodies out. And what was their great sin? They'd taken money aside that they'd, they were pretending to everyone that they were, that they were giving... Uh, this offering to the work, to the church, to the apostles, but they were really taking some of it themselves. And, um, and anyway, for their sin, they were taken away, they were judged. But what was their sin? You have lied to the Holy Spirit. At its heart, your sin was not a sin against your fellow man, it was a sin against God. <coughs> or take Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul. Breathing threats against the church, taking them bound, throwing them in prison, having them beaten, having some killed. He was an awful persecutor of the church. And one day, he's breathing threats on his way to Damascus. I'm going to get these churches out of the cup. Busting veins. He was filled with anger. He was going to destroy this church. He hated these people. He was at war with his fellow man who called himself Christians. And Jesus appears to him on the way in a bright shining light. <coughs> and Saul falls to the ground and he says, Who are you? Are? And do you know what Jesus said? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Oh, I thought I was persecuting Stephen in the church. No, you were persecuting God. Your sin was primarily the very It's God and will never deal with the horizontal until you admit the vertical. That's where it begins. Be reconciled to God. And everything else is a natural outflow. And the, and the flow isn't out in. Then we have to conclude that the vertical ain't really happening. You can sing the song, you can go to church, you can do this, you can do that. But if the vertical is just, if the horizontal is just all over the place, we need to get before God and learn from Him. You say, where am I with God? Now this is, a, this is an offer of mercy. I beg you, he said, be reconciled to God. We keep you. Be reconciled to God. That's the primary dimension. But now, th that's foundational. And I'm good at it. But I, listen, I just want to say to anyone here today, all have sinned. If you sin today, that puts you in the same company as 100% of all humanity, if you sin. But what will you do with your sin? Jesus died for your sins. And when he says be reconciled to God, that means you can be reconciled to God. You can be at peace with God in harmonious living and working relationship. If you would just come to him and say, Father, I confess that I have sinned. Forgive me my sin. 
I repent of my sin. And I trust in Jesus Christ as the only remedy of God. I receive you, Lord Jesus. I believe in you as my Savior today. And in Him, not my righteousness, but in His, in his I have reconciliation. He is all my righteousness, as the song goes. I stand complete in Him and worship Him. I have been reconciled to God. He paid a price he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to take my sins away. But now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid the price that I could never pay. Your sins have been paid for. Receive reconciliation with God today. But the middle dimension, the second dimension, is a dimension this I'm going to finish with. It's because we're, it's the one we started with, what Jesus said to them. He said, be reconciled to your brother. He said, first, be reconciled to your brother. It's the outflow. It's the, it's the horizontal. It's the relational. In Ephesians chapter 2, and again, I'll just read it to you. Verses 14 to 16. It says that he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing hostility. And God through Paul is speaking to the Ephesians who are divided as the Jews there, the Gentiles there. And he's saying, God has broken down the dividing wall between each other. When he broke down the wall between you and God, then instantly the wall that divided you from each other was broken down too. And he has created one new man. So there's neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, all are one and he has made you one. And the outflow, the immediate, necessary outflow of his work of reconciliation is that you are to be reconciled with your fellow man, with your, fe with your fellow human being. The alienation is over. And he says, so quickly now, go to all those with whom there may be conflict, whatever the price, if it's in your family, if it's in the, your church, if it's in the, your neighbourhood, in your relational network, amongst friends, the people that you work with, your friends, the people that you rub shoulders with and relate with, and as far as you are able, be reconciled. Be reconciled. Because I've got big things for you. You're, I've got big purposes for you. I want to use you to bring reconciliation to the cosmos, remember? I'm in the business of fixing the cosmic order and I don't want anything getting in the way and I know you don't too. To make sure that you're one with each other. Be reconciled to one another. I want to end with this beautiful little, well maybe it's disturbing but it is beautiful. It isn't beautiful, it's a disturbing one. It shows a bit, it leads to a beautiful picture of reconciliation. Uh, in the early to mid 1800s, the very famous Greek poet um, called Elizabeth Browning. Has anyone heard of Elizabeth Browning? And she was married to another, equally perhaps even more famous, certainly as famous poet called Robert Browning. And um, but uh, when she married him, she knew that her parents wouldn't approve. And she, they eloped and got married secretly. She didn't tell her parents. And right enough, as soon as her parents found out, they were most unhappy. They didn't just disown her, they disinherited her. And they shut her out of their life. And uh, for 10 years, Elizabeth Browning, she loved her parents so much and she wanted to find reconciliation with them. For 10 years, she wrote them long letters 
expressing and declaring the love that she had for them. She did all that she could to be reconciled. Her relationship with God, if you like, if we were to see her as a believer, a Christian, wouldn't be, would not be inhibited by their rejection or non-rejection, wouldn't be affected by it, but she still had to do all that she could, and she sent these letters, these lengthy letters over a 10 year period. Then she lived in Italy in the last years of her life. Um, after 10 years of sending this, these letters, one day this box arrived in the post. She opened up the box and in the box was all the letters she had sent, not one of them opened. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to him. And he gave us this message of reconciliation. But will you read it? Have you opened it? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not die. I will do that. He provided reconciliation for the whole world, but many have died unreconciled because they wouldn't read the mail. God has made reconciliation possible for all, but it is you, the I, who make it accurate. Father, we would read the letter today. We would take it to heart today. If there be a stone of stumbling that would undermine, that would impede your purpose, that as I stand at the altar of prayer and worship before you today, if there's a living relationship for somebody could point to me and point to something that I haven't done my utmost to put right. Lord, show me what that might be. Lord, you tell me that I'm able to sort it. I don't need to ask you to. We pray, Father, for those perhaps here today and they're in unreconciled relationship. Uh, we cannot make people accept our reconciliation in as much as you cannot make everybody be saved if they refuse to believe in you. But we can do our office and as much as you gave your utmost, your only beloved son Jesus, you put everything on the light line to accomplish our reconciliation. So we this day we follow likewise as our master and we say, Lord, if there's anything that we can do to extend the hand of love and work for reconciliation, show what that might be today. And we thank you that as such people we are no longer impeded. That regardless of what the response may be to these efforts, Christ-born efforts in our lives, we thank you, Lord, that we also have the ministry of reconciliation to this cause, this cosmos. May we prosper in Jesus' name.